Good evening. Glad to see all of you tonight. I hope uh, all of you's got your snowmobiles and your snow shovels and your snow plows and all that ready. The weatherman says that we're supposed to have snow this weekend. I'm going to sleet the snow. Well, that, that confirms what my father-in-law always says. Weatherman's job, the only job you can be wrong half the time and still get paid. So we will see what happens when it happens and just keep on pressing on. A few quick announcements while we uh, get started. If you plan on going to the art trip, <clears throat> please uh, get that in to Miss Pam as soon as possible. We would like to have it uh, done before the end of the month so we can get all the tickets, all the hotels, and all that uh, buckled down. The ladies' prayer group is meeting at 10 o'clock on Tuesdays again. The Ranlow uh, Baptist Church's Bible studies for the men is still on Tuesday. Uh, the 23rd of January, Sunday evening at 4 o'clock, we are having our outreach. I would like for all of you to be here. We plan to go out into the community with uh, D.O. Says and more and spread the gospel, uh, pass out flyers and tracts, and uh, just trying to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with people. So if you can mark that down, and if you, um, thank you, if you have an opportunity that you can be here, we would love to have you. Um, I believe that is all the announcements. Oh, uh, the, I got you, Miss Pam. <laughs> the giving records are out there on the table. If you uh, please would pick those up um, as you leave tonight. <clears throat> so any any other announcements that I need to announce? We're going to go play in the snow. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Uh, I will send out a phone tree if something does happen dr drastically. I, I have a four-wheel drive. I plan to be here no matter what. Uh, so, Mr. Eddie, your, your four-wheel drive as well. We could uh, come and have service. You got a four-wheel dig too, don't you? But uh, I'll, I'll let you know, I, I have an opportunity now to do a phone tree uh, at the house, so we'll play it by ear. Uh, but as far as I know right now, I'm planning to be here Sunday. Right. And you know by now, you're going to get a smart answer because I like to have fun. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll come pick you up in the Jeep. We'll, we'll do it. Uh, I, I think I can get four, so we can do. Rick, you got a Jeep. We can get eight here at a time. Just go. Hey, there you go. Hook them to the top. Hang on to the tire. Do what now? You ain't going to see me on the ski. <laughs> you won't see me on those skis. Nah, that won't be me. Promise you that won't be me. <clears throat> All right, well, let's uh, go ahead and get started tonight, and we'll continue our study in Genesis. Tonight is Genesis chapter 14. We are talking about... Uh, Still the Fallen, fallen series, uh, tonight is uh, Victory Over Kings. You know what I forgot to do, and I apologize, I forgot to uh, print out the uh, notes. So we are in um, Genesis chapter 14. It's uh, Victory Over Kings, 
And for some reason, I can't pull up my notes either, so we might just be winging it tonight. Uh, Let me see if I can reboot my tablet. Technology is great when it works, and it is... Awesome. Thank you. Great. (laughs) Tablet still ain't working, so. All right. Very good. Thank you so much for that. It's good to have uh, uh, people that are Johnny on the spot. So we will. Thank you, Melissa and Dana and Eddie. I I said Dana too. You was you was the carrier pigeon. All right, very good. So let's before we get on the the wrong uh, ditch, let's go ahead and move on. Uh, tonight we will uh, we will begin in prayer, and then we will dive into Genesis chapter 14. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for a body of believers that we can just come and have fun with one another. Lord, just love on one another and just please help us to be what you would have us to be. Lord, I thank you for this body of believers. God, I thank you for your love and your grace. I thank you for uh, just being able to come in a place where uh, you are real uh, your Holy Spirit are, is is always uh, here. God, and we thank you for that. Lord, I thank you for every everyone that is under the sound of my voice. I pray that we walk through this text and do uh, and see what you would have us to see. Lord, I thank you for loving us. I thank you for dying for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So with the link of the uh, text tonight, I will not go ahead and read all of it because, as you know, there is a ton of names, and some of the names I do I do not do very well with, so I'll try it one time, and that will be it. But tonight, I wanted to open up a little bit. Uh, the The title of the message is the uh, the victory over kings, and and you do you do realize that in every scripture. In every part of the Bible, every war that has ever been fought, God was always the victor in everything. We look at um, what he did with uh, Gideon. We look what he did with uh, Joshua. We look what he did with uh, many other of the battles. Uh, But God is always the victor, and he he has already conquered death hell in the grave, and we have the victory because uh, Jesus lives in us. We have the victory because Jesus lives in us. So I want to read a a little bit from J. Vernon McGee tonight on just what he has for the introduction for chapter 14. He says, first of all, let me say this is a historical document. In the first 11 verses, it is recorded that the kings of the east defeat the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah. For quite a few years, the critical radical scholars rejected this, saying that these men' names do not appear in the secular history at all and that, it, at, and that this is a rather ridiculous story. But did you know that the names of these kings have been found on monuments and tablets showing that they did exist? In fact, a, a pharaoh, a, a, a raffle, is now known to the horrible. Of other secular history, the record that we have here is tremendously significant. There was a war. And this is the first war that is mentioned in Scripture. Mankind began early in making war. Although this is the first war recorded, I do not know that 
it is the first war that ever took place. I do not think that the writer intends to give that impression. <clears throat> the reason it is recorded is because Lot, the nephew of Abraham, Abram, is involved. So I want to just read uh, a few things what uh, J. Vernon McGee said into this. And if you will, if you will look at this with me uh, tonight and just uh, uh, don't look at it as something... Oh, poor as me, I got to read something else that really doesn't make any sense. How many times in your daily reading or in your reading through the year, uh, trying to read the Bible through the year, do you come to a portion of Scripture and you ask yourself, why is this even in the Scripture? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't uh, fit the book. It doesn't fit the, the characters of the story. How many times have you done that? Well, can I tell you that Timothy tells us that the Word of God is inspired by God, so everything that is in the Word of God is in there for a reason. Um, we look at uh, Judah in the middle of the story of, of Joseph and Jacob and how Tamar went and, and uh, played the harlot there. And, and you look at that story when you're reading in Genesis and you see that story and you're like, why in the world was that even in there? Because it don't even go with the line that the stories was already saying. But can I tell you, God has a purpose and a reason for everything that's in the Scriptures. And we have to read the Scriptures for what Scripture says. And we have to believe that God is in control in everything. And there is things put in the Scriptures so we may see how great He is. In every portion of Scripture. So tonight, chapter 14, verse 1 says, And it came to pass in the days of Aphra, <clears throat> king of Sinar, Eric, king of El Elzar, Chedorlaomer, king of Elam, and Tittle, king of the nations, <clears throat> that they may war with Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, King of Gomorrah, Siba, king of Adam, Sebram, king of Zoboam, and king of Bela, that is Zora. Can you imagine trying to write these names in kindergarten? The parents that gave these people these names, you wonder how, how hard they had it trying to spell their name. All these joined together in the valley of Siddam. <clears throat> That is the Salt Sea, which is the Dead Sea. I've never uh, been to the Israel. I've never been to the Holy City, but I hear that the Dead Sea has a stench to it. Uh, so this is where they gathered, around the Dead Sea, around the Salt Sea. It says, 12 years they served Cheddar Lamir, and in the 13th year they rebelled. How often in the book of Genesis and, and through the story of Israel and the Israelites is that word in the story. They rebelled. Uh, we see often in the book of Judges uh, that, they say, that it says that the, the Israelites had sinned against God again. Turned their backs against God again. So how many times is the word rebel in the story of the Israelites? How many times is the word rebel in the story of your life, in my life? We, we have to be constantly uh, focusing on the word of God that we are doing what God wants us to do. So verse 5 says, In the 14th year, Shedar Lomir and the kings that were with him came and attacked the Rephim in Erish, Karnam, and Zimmum, and Ham, the Enum, and Sebev, Kareth, and the Horites, and their mountain of Zir, as far as El Paran, which is by the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to in Mishpah, that is Kadesh, and attacked all the country of the Amalekites, and also the Amorites who dwelt in Hezron, Tamar. <clears throat> and the king of Sodom, 
the king of Gomorrah, the king of Amma, the king of Zobom, and the king of Bela, that is Zor, went out and joined together in the battle of the valley of Sedum against Chedorlaomer, Lamer, king of Elam, Tittle, king of, uh, of nations, Arephel, king of Zinar, and Arek, king of Elzar, four kings against five. Now the valley of Sedum was full of asphalt pits. Uh, it's not the asphalt like uh, we see today that is paving our parking lots and our roads, but this is uh, the pitch, the mud, the muck, the mire that, that bears down in the, in the lowest part of the valley. So it says, Now in the valley, valley of Sidom was full of asphalt pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled. Some fell there, and the, and the remainder fled to the mountains. Then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom, and his goods and departed. Then one who had escaped came and told Abram, the Hebrew. Now, I never had a younger brother. I never had uh, my two sisters. I'm stuck in the middle of, of an older sister and a younger sister. So I really never had an older brother that would fight for me. But as soon as I saw this text, I saw that older brother bucking up and saying, you mess with him, you mess with me. You see in verse 12, it says, they also took, they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. <clears throat> then the one, <coughs> excuse me, then the one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt by the timbereth tree of Merimah, the Amorite brother Eskel, and the brother of Anor, and they were allies with Abram. So Abram got uh, this group together and said, hey, we're going down there to defend Lot. We're going down there to make them pay for what they have done. They Not only did they take all the goods and, and all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah, they messed with my kinfolk. So we're going down there to take care of business. <clears throat> Verse 14, now when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318, 318 trained servants who were born in his own house. You remember last week we talked about that Lot and Abram was walking together and they were driving all their cattle and they had to separate because their possessions was great. So you see another portion of what Abraham had. You see, he armed his. He armed his. Everything that Abram had, all the servants that Abram had, he gave them the weapons. He armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night, and he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobod, which is north of Damascus. That is, I don't really know how far that is, but as far as what uh, J. Vernon McGee says, that is a big stretch. And you, I want you to notice as well, uh, he divided his forces against them by night, you watch a lot of these war movies or these uh, shows that talks about special uh, forces and stuff. They do a lot of their missions at night because they can get more done in the night because people are not moving around as much. So they can be more stealthy and they can be more sneaky. So I believe that Abram, he knew what he was doing. He he armed all these people that was born in his house. They, he got all these people together, and they came together with Abram, and he divided his forces by night, and he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far 
as Hobel, which is the north of Damascus. Not only did they attack them where they were, they ran after them. The people that took off, they took off after them. They not only attacked them, but they pursued them. <clears throat> Verse 19. So he brought back all the goods. Notice that. So he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother Lot and his goods as well as the women and the people. I don't know about you, but when I was reading verse 11, I didn't see anything that said anything about they they taking uh, women. But they did say, then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. So I guess all that was tied uh, tied together when they took all that during the battle. But it specifies here in verse, excuse me, verse 16, not 19. So he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother Lot and his goods and well as the women and the people. Verse 17, and the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Sheba, that is the king's valley, after his return from the defeat of Sherelabim, and the kings were with him. Now it goes from, we were talking about this earlier, how some things are in the Bible that we really don't know why are in the Bible. But here we take a pause from all the destruction, all the war, and we take another turn to, to see something. Notice in verse 17, it says, And the king of Sodom went out to meet him, because Abram and everybody that went with Abram uh, defeated, brought all the goods back, all the possessions back, all the women back. The king were ha- was happy. <clears throat> then we come to verse 18. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, He was the priest of God, and he blessed him and said, Blessed blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who is delivered from enemies into your hand. And he, continue, and he gave him a tithe of all. Now, if you see verse 17, it ends with the king of Sodom. And then here in one, two, three verses, it talks about the, the Melchizedek. Don't really know where he came from. Don't really know who he is. It talks about that in three verses. And then it continues with the king of Sodom. So why is this there? Why is it really important that they put these three verses about this king, uh, Melchizedek, the king of Salem? Is it really important that they, that God just push, uh, three verses in here? Is, is that really important? How many of you have ever, uh, heard the name Melchizedek? Thank you. How many of you know what the, the word Melchizedek means or who it's uh, pointing to? High priest of his day, the king of righteousness. Who else? I want you to notice something. <clears throat> what does it say in verse 18? Thank you, Melissa. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, what did he bring out? Bread and wine. Oh, think about it a minute. Think about it with me. Think about it with me. Why is it in there? Why is three verses in there? In the middle of all this destruction, in, in the middle of all this this battle going on, the the east defeating all these kings, and then Abram getting all of his people together, all the people that was born in his house, and all the weapons that he had in his house. He armed all these people, and they went out and defeated and and got all the possessions, all the all the women and everything that that, that the other people got. And then this man, Melchizedek, come out with bread and wine. Melchizedek was a peacemaker. 
peacemaker, but it's also a symbol of Jesus Christ. You go, you go to Corinthians, what does it say? As often as you do remember me, I believe this is a, this is the first instance, and, and I could be wrong, but I believe this is the first instance of the Lord's Supper. He brought out the bread and the wine, knowing where, uh, knowing what was going to happen in the end, he knew uh, he was trying to preserve Abraham. He, Abram, he was trying to uh, get Abram to uh, focus on him and focus on the battle, focus on the victory. Because Abram had victory over the kings because of what? Because of the Lord. Nothing else. It wasn't him. It wasn't because he had all these weapons. It wasn't because he had all these servants. It was because of God and God alone. What did it say in verse, in, in chapter 12? And <clears throat> it's talking about that upon you I will make great nations. God was telling Abram. And this is, this is so neat. It says, Then Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, and he was the priest of God, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. Psalms 110 verse 1 through 5 says, The Lord said to my Lord. Man, that's, that's so good right there. That's up there. Look, look at that. The Lord said to my Lord. God said to his son. You see the cap, capital in the, in the L-O-R-D at first, and then you see the lowercase? God said to his son. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, power seat, till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteers in the days of your power, in the beauties of holiness. From the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the days of his wrath. Now, who sits on the right hand of the Father? Jesus. Power seat. Not a doubt in my mind. I, I, I believe Scripture, uh, I believe scripture uh, confirms that Melchizedek was, was Jesus. Reincarnate. I believe that, that in, in verse uh, 18 of chapter 14, we have the first uh, act of the Lord's Supper. When Melchizedek brought out the bread and the wine, the best bread and the wine. We're fixing to see something else, and I, this is why I, I believe that confirms that. In just a minute, we'll see what was coming up to Abram. Sir? Gave him a tithe. Yes. Yeah. So Hebrews uh, 7, verse 1 through 3 says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also the king of Salem, meaning king of peace. So Melchizedek was the king of, of Salem, meaning the king of peace. What's the song say? I know the peacemaker. He controls the winds and the waves. Oh, I'm glad I know the peacemaker. Verse 3 of Hebrews 7 says, Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginnings of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. I believe it confirms it. It, it. it confirms that Melchizedek is Jesus reincarnate. 
He brought the bread and wine, being the first Lord's Supper. It talks about him being in, in the uh, Psalms 110. It talks about in Hebrews uh, about the order of Melchizedek. And in the middle of all this war and battle is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords coming out with his bread and his wine. Now look at verse 21. Now the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord, God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap, and that I will not take anything that is yours, least you should say. I have made Abram rich, except only what the young men have eaten, and the portion of the men who went with me, Anar, Eskar, Mamar, let them take their portion. Abram didn't want to take anything from the king of Sodom because he didn't want the king of Sodom down the road saying that I made Abram rich because he was already rich because what? Melchizedek blessed him. Melchizedek was there giving him the bread and the wine. He was there uh, telling him that he has blessed him. He was telling him what God had told him before. He was giving him the promise. He was giving him the confirmation of what God has already told him earlier in Genesis chapter 12. When he said, Now the Lord has said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. I believe Jesus knew that Abram was going to be part of the line of his coming to his lordship, to be born in a baby. I believe that uh, I believe that Melchizedek come at that time and blessed Abram as a part of the promise that was already made by God the Father. And I really, I really do believe. And if something else comes up and I believe Scripture confirms that Melchizedek was the form of Jesus reincarnate. And in the midst of all this turmoil and all this, uh, all these battles, we see the victory over kings, not only in this war, but in the final war. That Jesus Christ holds the keys of Hades, death, hell, and the grave. He holds the keys. He has victory over death, hell, and grave. Just as God gave Abram victory in this battle, Abram, I mean, God gives you victory because Jesus Christ has already won the victory. We are conquerors because he conquered it all. We are conquerors because he conquered all. Father, I thank you for the night. I thank you for allowing us to walk through this. Or just to see how three verses can change a story, but three verses can uh, put confirmation on a bigger story. Lord, I praise God that you have sent your son to be the savior of the world. I praise God that you have uh, allowed us to see the things that you allow us to see. And God, I pray that we be everything that you would have us to be. And I pray that we slow down. And not just read through the scriptures just to get a check on a calendar today. But we slow down and really pay attention to what is going on in each story. 
And I pray that we slow down and, and really let the Word of God read our lives. Lord, there's so many things in scriptures that most of the time I don't even realize why you put it there. But God, I thank you. I praise you for every word that you have spoken, for every word that you have written, or that my life can be better by reading it. Lord, I thank you for loving us. I thank you for dying for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.